goals. Like the man from California who came carrying a red heifer. Purification purposes as directed in Numbers 19. Others have political inclinations, which in one example led to the burning of the Al Aqsa Mosque in 1969 by Dennis Rohan, a deranged young Australian Christian tourist. David Koresh, hello, how many have heard of David Koresh, Waco, Texas, the Branch Davidians? Here's where he came down with his mental illness. He was a Seventh-day Adventist before he got the Jerusalem Syndrome. David Koresh, who spent time in Jerusalem, may have been affected by the Syndrome, you don't say. But its effect was protracted, since only after he returned to the United States did he proclaim himself Moshiach and founded his sect at Waco, Texas. Some patients adopt magical health views or individual religious requirements, self-written prayers, and idiosync idiosyncratic customs. However, an interesting subgroup, which the psychiatrists identified consisted of 42 people out of the 470 study, who had no previous psychiatric problems whatsoever. Something just happened to me, <laughs> is a common response when such tourists begin psychotherapy. After four or five days, the patient treated at Kfar Shaul responds to the here and now approach favored by the psychiatrist. I feel like a clown, say some, in embarrassment and cannot explain how they came to jump into a pond in the middle of the city or sing hymns in the middle of the night from the top of the old city walls. They don't like to talk about the experience afterwards, says Barrell, when he tried to circulate a questionnaire to his former patients abroad for follow-up study. He got few responses, and those that replied gave vague answers. They simply don't understand themselves. What happened to them, says the doctor. Of the 42 who had no previous psychiatric history, 40 were Protestants whose families were strict, devout Bible reading Middle American Christians. They had internalized the good book and had an idealized view of Jerusalem. Barrell believes that the shock of facing the earthly Jerusalem caused a psychiatric reaction which helped bring the reality, bridge the reality with their dream city. He consulted a number of religious authorities, including Catholic leaders, to sound out opinions as to why Protestants, rather than Catholics, fall prey to the Jerusalem syndrome. Well, it may have something to do with the fact that they actually read the Bible. <laughs> I mean, pretty, pretty clear cut. I found three probable main reasons, says Barrell. Protestants direct their prayers to an unfathomable being, whereas the Catholics have the intervention of a priest, a tangible middleman. The second reason was that Jesus is the paramount religious figure in the Protestant creed, whereas the Catholics also have the Virgin Mary and many saints with whom to identify. Finally, Protestants, unlike Catholics, and followers of the Eastern religions in Islam have little religiosity incorporated in their rituals and few opportunities for spiritual fervor, which seem to be a necessary component of religious experience. In Judaism, also the psychiatrist feels, there are more opportunities for fervent religious experiences in the myriad rituals, deeds, and customs incorporated in the Jewish tradition. Dr. Barilal notes that the Jerusalem Syndrome is similar to the Florence Syndrome, identified by Italian psychiatrists who long ago noticed a tendency among tourists and visitors in that city to act in a bizarre, irrational fashion. In Florence, however, the phenomenon seems to be triggered by artwork and the beauty of the city rather than by religion. Another Jerusalem psychiatrist, Dr. Jordan Scheer, claims that many disturbed people flock to the holy city seeking special spiritual atmosphere that imbues, imbues the capital, especially the old city. Jerusalem, now listen to this, Jerusalem is flooded by Moshiachs. Those who come to meet the Moshiach, wait for the Moshiach, or settle the turmoil in their own souls. 
Many Jewish young people turn to yeshivas to enhance their religious drive. Dr. Shear observes that some who are accepted are expelled. Later, when they are, when they, after they are expelled, it is discovered they are disturbed, while others are turned down to begin with. Many of them find their way to the wall, which becomes a sanctuary. There, each one evolves his own way of expressing his inexplicable intoxication with holiness. For example, there is Motel, Motel, Motel. Dressed in all white, gray beard, matted, curling, yelling at a group of tourists, Welcome, America. Muddle has an enormous, bellowing voice. When he sings a prayer for rain, head flung back, hands outstretched toward the heavens, it sounds like a full symphony orchestra. Sometimes, for effect, he stands on top of the rabbinical office roof, roaring out prayers for rain. <laughs> the uninitiated think that it is the voice coming from heaven. And some have been known to do instant teshuva, at least for the next half hour. <laughs> there is Gershon, traping down the steps in a hippie uniform, reminiscent of the Woodstock era, complete with color, Bukharan skullcap, blue eyes, dancing white beard, dancing and white beard prancing, looking for all the world like a Jewish Santa Claus. A lean, black-clad Bratslaver Hasid paces back and forth outside the gates in the dark, reciting psalms to himself, twirling his meager beard, brown beard and concentrating on getting into the right mood. Yehia, the Yemenite, arrives. He favors the dress of his forefathers, a turban, with long flowing but dirty galabia and sandals, winter and summer. Yehia used to camp out in the German hospice ruins right above the wall, but the police chased him out. Yehia is a blesser. He distributes blessings to everyone, like others distribute candy to those who want and those who don't want. In a pronounced Yemenite accent, he bestows the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on the bowed head of the beneficiated murmuring quickly and without pause until he sees someone else in need of his consecration. At the top of the steps, Amnon stands at attention, day and night, Amnon, winter and summer. He roams the old city, dressed in a gray suit, tie, and a hat. He stands for hours, doing nothing, never sleeping, just being within the sight of the Temple Mount. Is he waiting for the Mashiach? Is he doing penance? Nobody knows. Nobody ever speaks to Amnon. He is just there, a silent sentinel, sentinel on a silent mission from God. Miriam is a squat, scarf-clad woman who appears at the wall at irregular hours, sometimes with a baby carriage in her tow, sometimes with a totter to as well. She has been known to swab the flagstones, kindly asking women worshipers to step aside as she goes around with the impossible job of washing down the huge plaza with a kitchen mop. This is at three in the morning. <laughs> and she's all around, right in front of the western cleaning, and asking everybody to please move while she cleans. Her name is, is Miriam, of course. Unsuspe <laughs> Unsuspecting visitors think she's official and feel sorry for the cleaning lady who has to work so late at night. <laughs> These colorful characters at the wall are not governed by canon or scripture, but they are drawn as generations before them to the spiritual center of the universe, the hub of the three monotheistic religions. Some of these people with problems, with extreme views, and others with otherworldly devotions may find themselves falling prey to this unique and still mainly incomprehensible Phenomena, the Jerusalem, the Jerusalem syndrome. And I want to just read and we're almost done. Listen to this. The Jerusalem syndrome. Um, let, me do, let me start here. Every year in Israel's holy city, a handful of Christian tourists are suddenly transformed from seemingly healthy, normal people to street preaching, psalm singing, Bible characters often garbed in nothing more than a hotel bedsheet. 
Psychiatrists have a name for this sudden onset of delusion, the Jerusalem Syndrome, which was first diagnosed by Dr. Heinz Hermann in the 1930s. Those who are affected by the Jerusalem Syndrome begin vigorously bathing to purify themselves, dressing in white robes or sheets, and begin preaching in the streets of Jerusalem, believing themselves to be Moses, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, or others who were sent on a divine mission. The Jerusalem Syndrome is usually benign. However, those affected by it have been known to cause trouble, such as was the case with Australian tourist Dennis Rohan in 1969, claiming to be on a mission from Goad. Rohan set fire to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This incident, doctors and law enforcement are now treating the bizarre behavior of the Jerusalem Syndrome with caution. And I'll close with this. One of the most controversial theories suggests that the Jerusalem Syndrome has been responsible before, was around before Christianity and may have actually contributed to the founding of the Christian religion. This theory suggests that the historical biblical figures of John the Baptist, the Apostles, and even Jesus were affected by the syndrome. Of course, we know that's not true. Okay, But this is how they take it to an extreme. This, however, does not provide an explanation as to the origins of such phenomena. And so, there is a clinical name for what's happening here with these plans of the flesh. There's a clinical name, and it's called the Jerusalem Syndrome. So, not every Messianic leader who denies Yeshua winds up in this kind of a, a mental condition. But it is a natural progression to that situation. Now you know why we're shouting the alarm. Now you know why we're warning people. Because I just named two or three people who went to Jerusalem just in the last year and they're suffering. Because when you think you're the Messiah and you could end in exile that's 2,700 years old, you're attributing supernatural things to yourself that nobody would attribute to a mere mortal man. So Wendy and Norman, with all the chases done, not only are they under the seduction of demonic spirits and the wrestle, the battle is, is, is spiritual. More than that, they are suffering from them, and I'm serious, we can see that very clearly. They are suffering from a mental illness known as the Jerusalem Syndrome. Be careful, because those who wound up with the Jerusalem Syndrome started with small baby steps, seeking. You know what the bottom line is? I read my lips. If you're seeking, you don't belong behind the pulpit. If you're seeking, you, don't, you shouldn't be an elder. It's okay to seek. It's okay to study. But not to teach Yahweh's people. And everyone in the union that is a seeking elder, I removed their listing. Even if they don't deny Yeshua. I took one guy in Canada, Rick Firth. He said, well, I haven't come to any conclusions. I'm still not sure. I still think, and I think, I think Yeshua may be the Messiah, and the virgin birth and so forth may be true. He says, but I'm not sure. I removed his listing. Because I said, when you are no longer a student, and when you are called to teach from Yahweh, if you're a student and you don't know if Yeshua is the Messiah and if he's the son of Yahweh, how can you hear his voice? My sheep know me, they hear my voice. If you don't hear his voice, you shouldn't be teaching his people. But this is the logical conclusion. Charging taxes, forming governments in exile, leaving the ministry to become a government official. And, and his goal was to, is to, to fight the Palestinians with guns and security, whatever else. Everything they have, you heard it from his own lips over that land. And the Jews will be happy because instead of giving the land to the Palestinians, Ryan. they're giving it to these Ephraimites who are fighting the Palestinians over the land. If this comes to pass, if this actually happens, you think the Middle East is a, is a problem now? How would you like to have your Ephraimite brothers and sisters toting guns and hand grenades, fighting the PLO over the West Bank, and the Jews just sitting back, drinking coffee, and go, Phew, I'm sure glad if Ryan is back. Think about it. Think about the implications of what's going on. And don't become seduced by this. Father, we thank you for your, the watchmen and the words that, you, that have been coming forth over the past two weeks. And Father, I know that there will be those who listen to these things and will twist our heart. They're going to twist our intention. They're going to twist to their own destruction accuse us of being harsh, and loving, and naming names. But Father, we know the truth. 
We know that when we don't name names, nobody even knows who to be warned about, and they could be succumbed by those people. And so, Father, we only do what you have told us. We only do what you have shown us to do. Father, we have not in any way overstepped our bounds to the left or to the right. But, Father, we walk in that authority that you gave this apostolic calling many, many years ago. Part of the apostolic calling, calling is what Rav Shaul did on the shores of Miletus when he took the Ephesian elders aside and said, I'm warning you. And he warned them of Alexander and Hymenius, who were calling the faith of some to stumble, teaching that the resurrection was already passed, that they had missed something called the rapture. Naming Alexander the coppersmith, who Rav Shaul said, has done me and the cause of the good news much harm. Much harm. And so, Father, we thank you that, that that love and yet that boldness abide in us. And that not one who is not part of the Miami Beach Israel revival getting this tape would be misled or seduced, thinking that somehow we, we have nothing to do but be on some kind of a witch hunt. Father, we know our hearts. We don't know our hearts. Because according to your word in your Bible, 17, 9, the human heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? But you know our hearts. So we put our hearts on the altar as we warn people of those who have succumbed to the Jerusalem syndrome and the great Ephraim might sell out. In Yeshua's mighty name, I call out Eli and Rue. Amen.
Twelve lessons, twelve tribes of 